everyone, and welcome to tonight's wonderful session, Felony and Fun. Not words that you often hear uh, put together like that, but uh, we're going to show you how that's possible this evening. Sisters in Crime is delighted to welcome you all here. It's been a tough few years, I don't know about you guys, but it's been some of the toughest of my life. So having the chance to talk about some reading, which is actually fun, is has been delightful. Reading these books in preparation for this evening has been delightful. Um, and so I can commend them all to you. So let's start by welcoming our panel. Kirsty Manning, Catherine Kovacic and Lucia Nardo, who will be talking to us tonight about how their plots and protagonists lift spirits and even crack smiles, and how crime and fun are not diametrically opposed. So please welcome them tonight. And of course, on behalf of Sisters in Crime Australia, I would like to respectfully acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we are gathered, the people of the Kulin Nations. Um, as storytellers ourselves, we recognise that this is the oldest continuous storytelling culture in the world. And we pay our respects to Elders past and present and acknowledge their, and uphold their continuing relationship with the land and sea. So this evening, I have the great pleasure, as I mentioned, of interviewing these three excellent writers about their highly, wildly entertaining books. Um, so just make yourselves comfortable so that you can all see the stage. Um, I'll be chatting for about 40, 45 minutes and then we're going to open the floor to questions from you. No, no. Aren't we? Oh, we're going to have a break we'll and no then questions. questions. Sorry, I'm, I'm off script. I'm ad-libbing. I should just stick with Carmel's script. All right, we'll break for drinks, book buying and book signing and the traditional Sisters in Crime raffle. In fact, there's a lot of shopping opportunities here tonight because the merch on the Sisters in Crime table is fantastic. There's some T-shirts, which I have already bought, for adults and kids. Um, there's some fabulous clips, books, um, great Christmas presents. So go check that out. Um, and, of course, the Sun Bookshop has a bookstall up the back. Uh, as Carmel mentioned, they've got advanced copies of Kerry's latest book. Um, hmm? Signed. Signed latest book. Um, the Sun Bookshop are also long-term supporters of Sisters in Crime and offer a 10% discount to Sisters in Crime members. So give them a round of applause as well. Now, in the second half, my bad before about forgetting about the break, um, we will resume for the raffle draw, that great Sisters in Crime tradition. Um, then we'll have questions, so you get to think about the questions you want to ask during the break. Um, and there's going to be a prize for the best question as judged by Katie Ma, my library colleague. And Carmel has written in the script, bribe her now. I take umbrage at that, Carmel. <laughs> more reliable and trustworthy than a librarian, ladies and gentlemen, really. Katie is incorruptible. Don't even think about bribing that woman. In fact, Carmel's, in her better judgment, deliberately chose a librarian to be the judge, knowing there would be no corruption involved. So, uh, At 9.45, we have to adjourn as Sisters in Crime needs to hold a quick AGM. They are actually legendary for having some of the shortest AGMs on record. It's awesome. Um, so stick around if you are a Sisters in Crime member. That's going to make things a lot easier. You can even sign up tonight on the spot. If you do have to leave, um, could you please fill out a proxy form and give it to Carmel or one of us who will be staying for the meeting because there's legal requirements around having a certain percentage of membership in order to meet the rules um, and make the AGM compliant. Those of us who work for the not-for-profit sector know all about these things and the importance of community governance, so help us out. would be very, very uh, grateful. And then after all of that, uh, there'll be continuing conviviality downstairs for those who would like to join us. Ah, any questions at this point? All right, great. I can get on with interviewing this uh, amazing panel. I'm going to introduce, uh, starting with the person on my immediate, and I can't tell the difference between left and right, but that is left, because that's <laughs> L. Okay, on my immediate left, Kirsty Manning has several novels under her belt. The Midsummer Garden, The Jade Lily, which she was just telling me before, is on the curriculum at Columbia. Yeah. Hi. 
so amazing. The Lost Jewels and the French Gift. Her latest novel is The Wonderful Paris Mystery. It's called The Paris Mystery. It's not called The Wonderful Paris Mystery, but it is a wonderful book. And look at that gorgeous cover. And we'll, we'll get into the cover. Um, Kirsty's also the partner in the award-winning Melbourne wine bar Bellotta, which I can also recommend from personal experience, um, and the Prince Wine Store in Sydney and Melbourne. Please make Kirsty feel welcome. Next to Kirsty is Catherine Kovavich, and Catherine has a diverse background ranging from veterinary medicine to art history. That's a lot of rich material for your fiction, isn't it? She is the author of the award-winning Alex Clayton art mystery series and has also delved into true crime with the schoolgirl Strangler. Most recently, she has brought the character of Peregrine Fisher from screen to page in the playful Miss Fisher's, Ms. Fisher's Modern Murder Mysteries, Just Murdered. When she's not writing, Catherine divides her time between the work in the heritage sector, dog training and running a family business. Catherine's new book, Seven Sisters, will be published by HarperCollins in January 2023. Let's give it up for Catherine. And I'm going to show you also a very glamorous cover. Look at that. It's pretty wild. Very 60s, right? And next to Catherine, we have Lucia Nardo. Lucia began her career as a social worker and community development manager, later moving into a corporate career as a company executive and business writer for some of Australia's largest corporations. And if that doesn't give you murderous intent, I don't know what will. Every day. <laughs> Since leaving the private sector, she has published non-fiction titles, articles and short stories. Lucia has taught creating writing in the TAFE sector and conducts writing workshops in the community and her debut novel, which I really enjoyed reading, is Messy Business. Look at this. It's great. So please make Lucia welcome. Now, I warned these three that I was going to ask them to start with the elevator pitch for their novels. For those of us in the room, or those of you in the room who haven't had the pleasure of reading these books yet, I'm going to start, I'm going to work in chronological order. So we'll start with the 30s when your book is set. <laughs> Kirsty, and you can um, give us the elevator pitch. Oh. Thank you. Um, so my, uh, the Paris Mystery opens with Charlie James, who is an Australian journalist posted to Paris. She is working as a foreign correspondent and she is sent out to a party at Versailles to cover, I guess, what is the party of the season, the summer season in Paris. And naturally someone dies there. And, um, and that's where the party begins. And I just, I just wanted to write um, um, a glorious kind of um, Agatha Christie-esque locked room murder that is set in that kind of last sigh of summer, that golden, heady era in Paris just before World War II. So it's it's fun, it's joyful. There's lots of fashion, food and champagne. It's fabulous. So, fabulous. Makes you want to be there. <laughs> Catherine, tell us, give us the elevator pitch for Just Murdered. Well, Peregrine Fisher is Phryne's niece. Phryne's plane has disappeared somewhere in Papua New Guinea. She's missing, presumed dead, but who knows? That's up to Kerry Greenwood. Um, and so Peregrine comes to Melbourne from somewhere in regional Australia to inherit Phryne's wealth and her place in the Adventuresses Club of the Antipodes. And along the way, she, um, well, she walks past a department store in which someone in a fashion parade is currently being murdered. And um, <laughs> then things, things, things unfold as they tend to do in the world of the Adventuresses Club. And um, so it's, it's 1964, so we still have the fashion and the fun. Um, but we have a, a, a more modern woman taking over the role of the, in the Adventuresses Club. Thank you. And Lucia, give us the elevator pitch for Messy Business. I hate elevator pitches. <laughs> um, and following these two is not easy. Um, so Jacqueline Byrne, who is the protagonist in my novel, is a, a woman whose life is in chaos. She runs a recruitment business, which is going under. She's got a cheating husband and she's got a stepson who arrives with a lot of trouble behind him. 
and there's a lot of murderous intent and a lot of shenanigans and she decides she's going to sort her life out and when she puts her plan into action it all goes horribly wrong and her partner in crime is Draga, her interfering Croatian housekeeper who just makes everything far worse than you can imagine. And that's basically, it goes downhill it's from there. It's pretty spectacular the way that things go from bad to worse in this book. It's deeply entertaining. Um, Kirsty, you mentioned um, in your elevator pitch, and thank you all for doing those because I hate them too, so I thought I'd pass that on to you. Um, but you mentioned uh, in the pitch and also in the author's notes that the back that you were you know this book was written in lockdown yes. and that you were looking for your own kind of escape so tell us a bit about how that informed the creative choices that you made sure um so if um you're probably not familiar with my other books but um so i write historical fiction a lot of them are set during world war ii or um in london the lost jewels um they traverse kind of they touch on for forgotten pockets of history and um, during lockdown you know they're quite they take a lot of research it takes me about a year to research and it often takes you into some very dark places and during lockdown you know we had a business closed I was at home with three teenagers I don't need to tell anyone in this room what lockdown was like it was challenging for all of us and I just I found myself reading a lot of crime a lot of thrillers I was watching a lot of crime on Netflix um, a lot of travel um, we have a business that in Port wine from France which is problematic when you can't get there to buy it um, so I was kind of imagining myself into a different world and into that kind of that delightful era in France which is just before the war because there was recession everywhere else in the world or depression but in Paris they would just seem oblivious to it the upper echelons of Paris they just kind of were continuing on with these ridiculous parties with swimming pools filled up with champagne Krug champagne and dressed in couture Chanel Dior all the couture houses were taking off and um, I started imagining that world and I said to my husband one night um, because I was actually commissioned to write another book and I said I don't think I want to do this I think I want to write something really fun and he said great what are you, what are you thinking I said I'm going to write a murder mystery <laughs> And he was like like a kind of sexy, like a sexy Agatha Christie kind of. And so I started reading all the classics. And I mean, the thing about a crime novel, right, is setting, you know, you look at Agatha Christie, Murder on the Orient Express, you know, Death on the Nile, you know, the Scandinavian crime books, Jane Harper, Sarah Bailey, your books. Setting is like huge, you know, whether it's overseas or back, it's like a character of the book. So I thought, um, I love Paris. Everyone loves Paris. You know, it's a great setting for a book, a great kind of golden era that's joyful and uplifting. And so I was kind of writing myself happy in this book. And I thought, well, if people want that, you know, if I'm feeling that, maybe other people want it too. So that's how this book kicked off. And I think it's no, um, it's no accident that these books have come out of this period of lockdown because, um, you know, the golden age um, of crime fiction that we associate with Agatha Christie and Dorothy Sayers and um, all of those uh, classic detective uh, novel writers, you know, it, it took place between the two wars where people were so traumatised by the First World War that they didn't want um, characters that were going to challenge them too much or engage them emotionally. They wanted those mind puzzles, that escapism, that game, you know, that kind of almost that game element. And it's, I, I got that with all three of your books. There's that kind of play, which is really important. And, and so it doesn't surprise me that that's sort of happened during the COVID pandemic because it is this lovely escape. Did you did you have a similar sense, Catherine, of, of writing for for an audience that maybe was a bit traumatised and needed an escape? Well, I actually wrote, I think probably wrote most of it in the early stages of lockdown. So it was it was all very weird. But I, unlike you, Kirsty, I actually spent a lot of lockdown thinking about how to kill people. So that probably comes out <laughs> in the next book. But that's just my family, so we won't go there. Um, but yeah, I think it, it was a really good escape from, from all that stuff that was going on to be able to go, let's look at fashion in 1964. And so 
I, like I was looking at videos from the, the National Film and Sound Archives on that were promoting you know Melbourne and Sydney for 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 immigrants and things, and so just all the glory of, of Melbourne in 1964 with you know, lovely trams and that very jolly 1950s sort of music, you know, the do, 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 as people go to the Victoria Market and are dressed in fabulous clothes. So it was very escapist for me too in that respect. And then you could go down these lovely rabbit holes about, you know, she's, she's going off to play squash, so what sort of a squash dress is she going to wear in 1964? And then you go into all the really weird things about, you know, women getting in trouble at Wimbledon for showing their frilly knickers at the tennis championships. And so lots of rabbit holes to go down with that whole feminist angle too, which was quite fun. But um, it was really very diverting. And it's, it's, I mean, it's a fascinating premise. You've gone from screen to page, whereas most writing goes from page to screen. Um, how was that for you? Really scary. It was mm. when, when they approached me to do it, it was like, oh, my God, this is really exciting. And I was like, following on from Kerry Greenwood. Okay. Um, following on from a really successful television series. Mm -hmm. And um, so I had the script for, for the, the first show and it was, you know, just you know, maybe about 25 to 30 pages. And they're like, great, make an 80,000 word book out of it. Okay. And you can kind of just stick to the plot, but just do whatever you like with it. But tell us everything that you're going to do because we're going to say you can't do that. <laughs> Good. Um, so there's a there's a whole there's a Fisher world that that you need to adhere to um, with the aesthetics and and the audience because the audience are you know they're Franny's audience and they love they love what they love about Franny and so it was scary but fun at the same time mm. and you did it so well like it's absolutely true to um, to Franny's legacy you can totally imagine Peregrine as her niece um, and you know Franny herself is sort of there as a bit of a spectre in the book. We don't know what's happened to her. We're pretty confident she's going to be all right because Phryne. Um But uh, yes, it's 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 very well done, and it's sort of lovely because it's sort of almost like a um, here's here's Phryne for the next generation. You know, yeah, Peregrine. She's, she's very much her own woman, but mm. that that legacy is very strong mm. in what she does. Yeah, I love it. I love it. And Lucia, we didn't mention when you when you were doing your elevator pitch, but Messy Business is a contemporary story, right? More or less set in contemporary yes. times. Yes, it is. Yep. In Melbourne. Yep. And I was thinking Bayside somewhere. Yeah, Bayside. There's a few yeah. mentions of yeah. coastal properties and yes. things. Yes. Yeah. Um, More the west, a bit of Port Melbourne. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Kind of and so, what was the general Genesis of the story for you? Well, it wasn't written in lockdown. <laughs> I, um, some of um, the people here will know Cheryl Clark, who's a member of yes. Sisters in Crime. Right, now New Zealand. Yes, yes, yeah, she's deserted us, hasn't she? Yes. <laughs> um, so I was trying to get in. At the time, I was back in 2009. I was finishing a um, diploma in professional writing and editing, and Cheryl was then my teacher, and. <laughs> It kind of feels weird saying that now, but um, and I wanted to do this fiction subject she was doing. It was just a one semester thing, and I hadn't actually done any fiction subject. So she said, "Give me three thousand words on something." So I started writing about this really narky, grumpy woman who runs a recruitment agency and hates her husband. <laughs> and I thought, and I handed that in, and I got into the, I got into the subject, and then I had to keep writing it. So I kind of wrote it on and off over that period of time, but it was certainly finished in the last, you know, the, the last couple of years, the, the year 21, 22, or 21, 2021, mm -hmm. is when I kind of really, um, no, you know, settled down to really finish it off. But it, it had been doing the rounds of some publishing houses and getting nice feedback, but nothing, you know, concrete. You know what it's like. Oh, we love it, but, but you know, I'd rather you say it's shit so I can fix it. <laughs> anyway, so, um, yeah, so it is contemporary. Um, yeah. And you but chose to self-publish in the end? I did because I had committed to a literary festival. I had a publishing contract with a small publisher and I had committed to the literary festival and then the publisher, for various reasons, um, was unable to fulfil her end of the contract. And I thought, well, it's in the literature for the literature festival. I better do something. So I just, I just self-published it and, you know, yeah, so... 
Well, unfortunately, I've got a stepson who's a very clever graphic designer, and so he did all this magic stuff and little trailers and God knows what. Fantastic. Yeah. Just, yes. you, know, you know the old expression, an ounce of per presentation is worth a... No, an ounce of performance, pound of performance or presentation, or so I can't remember it now, but it's something about being showy it has more value in it um, than the actual work itself. So I'm relying oh, no, on my stepson. This is, this is substance uh, as well as style. Okay, Believe cool. me, Lucia. Um, I can confidently say that. Um, well, uh, rather than go, to go in sequence with each of you, because that can yep. get a bit dull, and do feel free to kind of weigh in on each other's um, comments. But, Lucia, I might stick with you while we're there <laughs> to talk about um, your two main characters. So yep. Jack is the, um, the Naki um, manager of her own recruitment agency and the yep. disappointed wife um, and Mr. Ruin and Mr. Ruin <laughs> so Rowan who is whose name is pronounced Ruin by um, Draga the uh, the housekeeper and most appropriately yes. um, it's beautiful actually um, tell us about so Draga she, she's such an amazing character thank you she's got to be based on someone real well, she's kind of an amalgam of many, many women I have known, um, both Croatian, Italian, Polish, like it's just that generation of, of women who I was just um, talking to Catherine before and saying that, that, you know, most of us these days, you know, housework and cooking, it's the, they're kind of chores. But, you know, particularly for my mum's generation, it, it was all about the the kind of craft they brought to all of that. They had a real pride about it. So, yes, yeah, so she was based on someone, but she actually wasn't part of the novel to begin with. She only came onto the page because I was thinking, well, if this woman's got a recruitment business and she's got a husband who's got an investment firm, then surely she can afford a housekeeper, you know, to come <laughs> and vacuum for her or something. And so, um, and so that, that's how Draga appeared on the page. And then I couldn't let her go. Mm. Um, and so she just kind of stayed there and not just came to do the housework but kind of moved in <laughs> and just <laughs> sort of ended up sharing the house and, and, the and making everyone and the criminal business. activity. <laughs> yeah, that's right, and all the criminal activity. So, yeah. Um, the, the, it's, it's worth noting, so Draga... Uh, mostly speaks English in the book. She occasionally lapses into Croatian um, and her English is quite, uh, it's not fluent, shall we say. And, you know, as I said, she calls Rowan Ruin and a few things like that. Um, at first, I was, that kind of jarred on me a little bit, but I found myself really taking to her particular syntax. And um, did you feel like that was a, a, a risky move? Oh, definitely, because I thought if if just so I'm sending it out to publishers and they start hearing the way she speaks, they're going to go, where the hell's the editing in this? But uh, as you get into it, you obviously start to realise, and I, and I think I had a little bit of a setup there with Jack talking about, um, you know, Draga's incapacity to, you know, um, define what which is the right pro to, pronoun and all this kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, it was a bit risky, but my, my my late dad helped me with the with the Croatian. Um, he thought it was wonderful <laughs> being asked. He couldn't wait to see the book published, but unfortunately he never made it. But um, my dad was an interpreter, so he ca he came to Australia as a refugee, and uh, after the war, and bought like many many um, people did, bought the local milk bar. <laughs> And around the corner, there happened to be a police station. And so they knew that Dad spoke Croatian, Italian, and, and English. He taught himself English with a Webster's Dictionary and a set of encyclopedias. And um, so the cops were coming around every two minutes. Oh, we've got this bloke. We can't understand him. And anyway, so Dad spent more time out of the milk bar at the police station. <laughs> My mum was really annoyed because she had to do all the work. And um, he founded the Interpreters Association with a number of other people. Wow. So he's, he's command of like you know the if you did it like on the purely correct Croatian or Italian yep. if you're doing it that way it would just sound wrong yep. so I ran absolutely everything past him and he 
double checked, which is the big problem for me now because um, Dad's no longer here, and if I'm writing the sequel and I want to throw in some Croatian, I've got to find someone find else new, to do that. And I mean, Google format. Translate is all right, but yeah. no, no, you need a new. I can help you with that actually. Oh, is there? <laughs> there you go. This was 1968, I think. Wow. I've still got his certificate at home. I wonder if that early engagement with the police might have subtly kind of influenced your crime writing career. I, I used to go to court with him. I used to love going to court with him. And when I was a social worker, I had a client almost murder me, so I had to go to the trial where his barrister came up to give me instruction and reeked of booze. And um, the guy had no memory of the of the crime he'd committed or anything. It wasn't... He was looking for me and he couldn't find me, so he found somebody else, unfortunately. Oh, so that, that's pretty horrible. But, yeah, I used to go to court a lot. And we used to have police cars in front of our place all the time. I'm sure everybody thought we were crims <laughs> because <laughs> there was just cop cars it's, there it's, all the time. It's, it's interesting what you say because I think that's probably how you get away with the... Um, because it's consistent. The language, the structure of the language and the way she speaks yes. is consistent throughout. Yes. Um, on the subject of language, so we're in the swinging 60s in Melbourne in, with um, Just Murdered. How, so you talked about doing that research around the fashion and the look and you know what was contemporary, how the trams looked, all that kind of thing. Did you also have to research the way people spoke? And if you did, what were the kind of good resources for recreating that era. First of all, I have to say how much I love Drago. I just never <laughs> go back there because it's so great. Yeah, it's a European background, so she, you know, lots of women like that, and things like crashing the pots and pans in the kitchen when yeah. things are going. I just like I, memories come flooding back. Um, language in the 60s. So because we're 64, we're ahead of that whole the real hippie era and getting into that kind of really far out sort of language. Um, so it was much more that um, when you think of the news readers of, of the the early television period, that sort of that almost British English, so the more formalised way of speaking, um, and there's a little bit of you know crossover because of course. Peregrine's the younger generation and she's dealing with the adventuresses who are more of Franny's generation, a little bit younger, so there's a little bit of, you know, she gets to say a few things like, you know, she'll give it a red hot go, which doesn't really wash very well with the adventuresses who are a little bit more straight laced. Um, so there, there was definitely that, that research, but that also came in, the, the National Film and Sound Archive was brilliant for a lot of those, the early news, the early documentary things, to see what what Australia was like and how, how we viewed ourselves and how we spoke in in that period and particularly you know because it was that that changing time in the 60s you, you got a lot of those sort of slightly outraged or slightly surprised news stories about hemlines or um, we were moving from suspenders and stockings because when your hemlines go up you can't show your suspenders so that's when pantyhose and things like that came in so these were quite quite innovative sort of things so the advertising and the clothes actually overlapped quite nicely with some of the language and and that sort of expression and the vernacular of the period Old lawnmower commercials, like wow! If you, if you want some want some blokey language and those old um, beer commercials too, you know we remember that the, the blokey blokes of that sort of era. So they were all coming in too. And magazines are always brilliant because um, the, we all love the written word. So that that gives us that that sort of expression from the period. And so the women's weeklies, the women's weeklies from the period were really quite lovely to dive into. And we should point out that um, that a lot of the action takes place in a department store. I think the, the um, fashion parade's in the department yep. store to begin with and Peregrine goes undercover there. So you've got this kind of great stage for exploring a lot of that. Yeah, so that's sort of, I think... It there's sort of like elements of the Maya mural hall, um, the old Buckley's and Nun, uh, that was. Um, so that, that whole idea of, you know, the, when there were actually people in departments on the shop floor, you know, standing there waiting to help you. <laughs> <laughs> Who knew? We I mean, mentioned it was a historical <laughs> novel, didn't we? <laughs> It, yes, it does. It does make you a bit nostalgic. Yeah, just you know, arranging the twin sets while you wait for the customer, the brunch coats, you know, just while you wait for the customer to come through. So beautiful, so beautiful. Um, and look, it's it's speaking of fashion, which your book does a lot. Um, I actually wanted to. I think I had only one kind of 
the only point at which I took umbrage in your novel was with your Russian um, fashion designer who's straight. I'm sorry. I just kept expecting him to be outed at any moment. Well, there's a there few more a books sequel. to go. <laughs> it's not, not locked in. But that was... Um, so the, the descriptions of the gowns that he made, so he made several gowns for Charlie mm. um, because Charlie's come from Australia and, you know, like most Australians, we're pluk, as the French would say, you know, we, we don't scrub up all that well. We need to get borrowed, ra- you know, glad rags to go to some of these beautiful events like the parties at Versailles. And the descriptions you have of those gowns are absolutely exquisite. Are they based on real gowns? Yes, so I um, I had him as a fictional designer for Maybusher which is one of the couture houses but um, then we had Dior and Chanel and remember um, at that time there was a lot of media coverage of there are a lot of beautiful photographs and and um, Elsie DeWolf is a real person she was an interior designer in America she was a former actress and she basically made her wealth and became famous in America as the first interior designer in America basically putting storage and painting houses white. So she worked for the Fricks and the Vanderbilts and, you know, when America was really industrializing. But what they didn't have was elan and cachet. And so she would import sways of antiques from France to America. And she she amassed this huge wealth and she bought um, the house in Versailles, Villa Trinon, which is a fictional one in my book, but it's an actual one. And she had a female partner but she married a British diplomat um, when sadly her partner died and he had a male partner but it was a marriage of convenience Mariage Blanc, I think, no, they call it. I think yeah. it was because um, because they were able to entertain everyone and he'd backed the wrong horse in England this is true um, so he uh, had backed the king who'd abdicated and they were friends with the Win- Windsors who we now know were quite odious people but they so I have them as real people at my parties and the dress that she wears is a real dress that she wore to a party at Villa Trinon because they were all photographs so there are lots of um, photographs of because she was such a society lady of you know people Indian Maharajas arriving um, on elephants with emeralds on not only their foreheads but the elephants foreheads and um, you know the women you could not not dress in couture it was it was you know there was so much wealth that they were oblivious to the rest of the world and it was I think it's just um you know the craftsmanship and the delight and the beauty in those dresses I mean they're almost a character in themselves and I think um the transformative um element for Charlie James so she's a journalist so it's implausible for her to wear couture she couldn't afford it she's not from a couture background so she has to borrow the dresses as anyone in Paris would but the way that her body transforms and her confidence and she she's quite um, it's a little like that scene in The Devil Wears Prada where she think, where you know the Anna Winter-esque character dresses down the character and says you think you're just wearing this plain blue jumper but really it dates back from and she realises you know the creativity and the power of fashion and how it can really um, you know putting on something can make you feel really wonderful and also the power of what you wear underneath so I think she's going through her own stuff and you know fashion really helps her and she has a best friend who I think was one of my favorite characters ever to write Violet who is of course way more fashionable and worldly than her and smarter the smartest person in the in the newsroom actually but of course she's the secretary because of her background so um and also we should point out that Charlie Charlie gets the job as Charlie James Mm. um um, applies for the job as Charlie James, um, flies to London when she uh, succeeds in taking the job and then meets the editor who's like, sorry? Charlie? <laughs> yeah, well, that was, that was, that's that was actually lovely. based on a true story yeah. because um, a friend of mine was working for a, a Japanese TV channel and this was before uh, Zoom meetings and photographs and she arrived in Japan and they didn't realise because her Japanese was so brilliant, they didn't realise she wasn't Japanese, and which is a problem. 
on Japanese television <laughs> at the time, 20 years ago, to anchor the Olympics. So it presented them with quite an awkward moment. So I've, I've always remembered that when she was like, didn't somebody look into that? But of course, with Charlie, that... Um, I really wanted to get across because it, there is a moment. I don't think I'm giving anything away in the in the book, but um, certainly in that time in the 1930s in the newsroom, you could only work on the women's pages, and then you had to retire when you got married. And it turned out she actually, would you believe, became quite good at journalism and being a reporter. And and she had quite a sympathetic boss, and he said, "Okay, you can write somebody." She didn't get the job because she was good at it. She got the job because the man couldn't turn up on the day and had to go to hospital and um, and he said okay we'll run the story but you have to be Charlie not Charlotte mm. to run the story in the in the main part of the paper otherwise she had to write about um, ladies lunches and stockings in the rest of the paper so she got a big breakout writing for a homicide and and that's true you know and also writing her in Paris with the Paris mysteries I had to have um, you know it's a bit awkward in a murder mystery if you don't have somebody who can move around and get the story yes. and it's implausible like there were just no female police detectives let alone police officers in Paris so I knew she had to be from outside France I knew she had to have agency and a way to get around into different people's houses and parties and things like that so it's it became and the fact she's a writer it's quite a useful tool mm, mm, absolutely it's always um, it is always tricky um, creating a premise for why particularly a younger woman would be allowed and enabled to investigate. So in Peregrine's case, we've obviously got Phryne's legacy, Phryne who ran her own detective agency, but Peregrine's not running her own detective agency and she's not a journalist. So how did you navigate that, Catherine? Well, what we did with Peregrine, um, obviously she's, she's taking on Phryne's legacy and when she arrives, she doesn't know that her aunt was a detective, but she's stumbled into this murder because someone else in the Adventurous Club is involved in it. And that woman latches onto her and says, oh, thank God, a fisher, you can help me. And that's when Peregrine discovers what her aunt did and decides to give it a red-hot go, much to the disgust of everybody else. But, of course, the police, we've got the male police who are, you know, they. There's, we've got our you know, chief inspector who thought, well, he's rid of that interfering fisher woman. She's disappeared somewhere. Good riddance to bad rubbish. And we've got the younger detective who has worked, we find out, with Phryne on some occasions and finds her both a thorn in his side but also a very useful asset. So Peregrine's still stepping into those shoes. And we, we actually have, there's a, there's a female policewoman in the background um, in the police station moving files around, but actually very astutely, you know, picking up on, on all the details. And um, unfortunately, in Victoria, policewomen didn't get their own handbags to carry their truncheons and cuff link, uh, handcuffs until 1970s. So that was very disappointing for me because I really wanted that police issue handbag <laughs> to be part of the ensemble. But sad to say, my policewoman, she just had to carry her own handcuffs. But so, so Peregrine becomes that. She's, she has to needle away at, at the police officer. And of course, we, we have that same Jack Robertson thing going on that was going on with Phryne. So she, she just basically inveigles her way in, um, manages to shut a few doors in his face, literally and figuratively, and, um, and basically makes herself useful and finds out those things. Because we're, we're in a department store, there's models, fashion involved. So she finds out those things that, you know, a man, what's he going to know about the fact that we're talking about a missing stocking, <laughs> honestly. Um, so she finds out some of those details that he can't find out and he really finds out that he does need a woman named Fisher to help him solve his crimes because and who does And it's lovely. It's that, you know, it is a very reminiscent um, frisson uh, that, you know, Jack and Franny have that you've recreated there but made quite, like, it's, it's very fresh. It's not, there's not a feeling of it being pastiche. It's a feeling of it being you know, an all new relationship um, brought forward. It's it's really well done, and I did love the policewoman character. I'm, hope, I'm hoping that she will continue into the next oh, so, series. Yeah. So, what happens with the next book? Like, is, are you beholden on another script to be able to write a sequel, or is, is that even on the cards? Um, not sure at this stage. It's it's because it's tied to the television show, so it's dependent on whether they get greenlit for a third series of the show, as whether we do a book, and then we haven't really sort of we've, we've 
talked vaguely about whether it would be based on another script or not. So I think there's there's definitely wiggle room there. Because mm, she could also take on a life of her own. Lucia, you've hinted that um, there'll be a sequel to Messy Business. I'm trying to write that now, but... Microphone. <laughs> I'm trying to write that now, but um, I'm a bit slow. That's all right. There's yeah. no, you know, there's no it's time limit. Much. No, no, no. There isn't a time limit. Um, it's one of the lovely things about being a writer. It's not like being a pop star if you haven't made it by 40. It's okay. You can still keep going. My um, son tells me it's 28, but anyway, <laughs> that's another story. <laughs> um, but um, again, I wanted to go back a little bit to Jack because, again, going back to that issue of how do you feasibly create a character who's not a professional detective or a police officer, but give them license to investigate. So how did you navigate that in messy business? Well, it wasn't that hard. I just did what Rhoda as any self-respecting, enterprising woman would do, and she went through his stuff. <laughs> you know, like, and so that would be one thing, um, I suppose. I think she just stuck her nose in, you know, that was, and, and tried to do it surreptitiously with sometimes success and other times no. And I think Draga kind of just followed on behind in her own unique kind of way. Um, but it's interesting just listening to you guys talk about your your books because I, I was reading them, in particular the Paris one. I kind of felt like I was gliding, you know, through with these beautiful fashions and the silks and the and the, all of that. Parties. And then, oh my god. Yes, parties. and then and then you know the '60s stuff because I love the '60s. You know, I just absolutely love it. I remember going to Maya if I went shopping. If you went into the city from the wilds of the western suburbs, which was Yarraval, you know, like so it's <laughs> 10 minutes away, but you would go and you would have to wear a hat and gloves. I was like a kid and I had to wear my hat and gloves and it was all very, it was all a big deal, you know, and I got the real sense of that. Whereas my characters kind of bumble around in sweatshirts and aprons and, you know, there, there's nothing, there's nothing um, kind of elegant about glamorous them at all, you know, glamorous <laughs> about them all. They just kind of dive in and then whatever happens kind of happens and yeah. She does um, also recruit some, she recruits sort of young techno savvy people to help her with a few yes, she does. She, along the way. She, you know, threatens you know, no employment if you don't you know, follow the rules and stuff like that. Yes, yeah, so she does, she does get around a bit, but she's angry and you know, an angry woman is a driven woman and she was going to get to the bottom of, of whatever. Hmm. Can I keep going, Come on, It's 8.50. Do you want us to break now? Oh, another five minutes. Five. We can have another five minutes? Excellent. Good. I was hoping you would say that. Um, Kirsty, in the author's notes at the back of the book, you talk about some of the real-life journalists who've inspired Charlie's character, mm. which I found so interesting. Do you want to share that with the... Uh, audience? Sh sure. I, um, so I read a lot of memoir and I was reading um, a series of, um, I guess, collected articles by uh, New Yorker magazine's first Paris correspondent, Janet Flaneur, and I was just telling you, you know, she was witty and smart and she, she was posted to Paris. Um, she was married and then she was posted to Paris and she um, ended up with her partner there and they went to all the parties, the art, and um, she was friends with Hemingway and Gertrude Stein and they had these incredible um, salons and they met at the Du Megawatts. <laughs> you know, they, they caught up and it was it was quite extraordinary and her work was really sharp and um, and sassy. You know, she really, those were the days when you were a columnist, you could really say what you thought. And remember she was typing these up, sending them back to New York. They were edited and posted and she ended up, she was the foreign correspondent in Paris for 30 years. So she covered the war, she's covered, you know, many, many things. And she's, she's very famous. Um, she's a very famous writer. So I wanted to grab her kind of sassiness. But the other person that really um, inspired me was uh, Louis Mack, Louise Mack, who was an Australian foreign correspondent. So this is where I thought this is actually plausible. And in um, World War One, she actually worked um, for the Times and she broke a number of the key stories. She was in Belgium in World War One. Um, she went behind the front lines and there are lots of stories 
stories of female correspondents dressing as sappers and really bringing the key turning points of the war, um, their stories, to to the page and Louis Mack was one of them and she came back to Australia and she did a speaking tour, a woman's weekly speaking tour because she had to earn some dough and she'd like literally go to town halls and you'd get your chops and veg. Women would turn up to hear her regale her stories behind the front lines of the war, um, a bit like a black like author speaking to her now. And, um, and so I have a bit of fun in the book because I have young Charlie being taken to one of the lunches to hear Louis Mack speak and say oh imagine if I could do that so that's where that story was born and then um, one of my dearest friends for whom the character is named is Sarah James and she's a she was a foreign correspondent she worked for NBC for a long time on Dateline and she actually has an Emmy she got the Emmy for the Columbine covering she made a documentary um, many years ago about the Columbine murders sadly when um, she thought that was an anomaly, not, not, not the norm in America. And, um, and she's become one of my dearest friends and she's travelled to every corner of the globe and she now lives in Australia. And I guess from Janet to Louis to Sarah, the, um, and, and the play with Charlie was a bit like Louis because she wasn't Louise Mack, she was Louis Mack, of course, because she also, her byline was um, ambiguous. I guess in that sense, and yeah. um, and so what I got from them was that sense of you know forthrightness, the directness, and that absolute um, kernel of self belief you have to have when the world is kind of shifting and changing around you, and when everyone is a hard no to you, basically, mm -hmm. um, how you just have to keep putting one foot in front of the other and mm -hmm. and banging it out, and they don't necessarily have the answers of how to do that, but what they do all of them from Sarah to back to Louis is they show up like they keep showing up and they mm. keep asking the questions and I think that is what makes them remarkable all of them so I tried to channel that into my young Charlie and hopefully as it goes on you'll see her evolution mm. to be like you know as amazing as these women but and you know she has to start somewhere absolutely and, and, and I love you know I mean I think crime fiction excels at the characters who sit outside the cultural norm you know, um, you can think of a character like Charlie and think, oh, you know, that's not feasible for the 1930s, late 1930s. A woman wouldn't be like that. And yet, as you say, there are all these historical precedents for exactly the kind of character that Charlie is. And there are always cultural outliers, and cultural outliers often make really, really interesting characters in books. And Peregrine's one of those, isn't she? She's not... She's a bit ahead of her time. Yeah, she's, well, she's, I guess she would say she kind of grew up slightly on the wrong side of the tracks, if I can use that expression, because she, she's a bit, she's a rough around the edges, but she's, she's keen to learn and she's very much, she's, she's a woman of that era, so she's seeing those doors opening and she's prepared to push on them and, and push her way through. And then suddenly she's got all her aunt's wealth and the house and the car and the things that go with it. And you could see that that could go off the rails quite completely and then she's got Detective James Seed over there <laughs> who apparently we like a lot um, so yeah there's, there's a lot of ways that she could turn out with this um, but she's, she's got she's got that, that 1960s spirit that well I shouldn't say 1960s because as we just said it's, it's women from yes. all those eras and going back to, to Louise Mack the original Louise Mack you know she, she I think she was a brilliant judge of character herself and you see that in her writings both her non-fiction and even her, her early fiction, which was, I guess, teens. Did you read teens? Which is sort of like the naughtiest girl in school meets getting a wisdom written in about 1904, I think. And so that whole idea of, of women being able to push themselves forward well, I guess kind of letting the men think that they're not doing that and that's all their idea anyway. But getting their foot in the door and going ahead and having that red hot go and seeing where you can get with it. 
and I think that the other lovely aspect of it is the sort of um, the relationship between Peregrine and um, the adventuresses of the Antipodes who at first are quite because they're so bereft at, at Phryne's loss are quite um, standoffish with her but they sort of come around and, and kind of mentor her and they perhaps sense that she needs a little bit of that guidance and that's really I, like, I love the way those kinds of relationships are played out as well. Yeah because she's she's got a, a troubled relationship with her own mother who has passed away so these women essentially become the family that she doesn't have and that she needs not so much to, to guide her because she's got a pretty good compass herself but to be that, that backup and that support. Mm. Yes to stop her embarrassing herself perhaps <laughs> as young people want to do. Um, <laughs> Lucia um, there's also you know we've talked a lot about Draga who we all love and the relationship between her and Jack but there's also some really lovely I really love the kind of um, kinship relationships that emerge in the story particularly with between Jack and her stepson mm. um, with whom she has a pretty distant relationship to start off with mm. um, talk a little bit about that relationship and 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 where he fits in. Well, he was another character that just appeared on the page because, you know, you like to give your characters multiple problems and in the wrong circumstances a stepchild can be a pretty <laughs> horrific problem. I've got three stepkids and they're fantastic but <clears throat> it's not always, the, you know, I've got a lot of friends who've got stepkids and it's not always easy. Um, but look, I think it just... Uh, I was trying to, in a sense, now that I think about it, write about family that comes about not in the traditional way. So, you know, you've got Draga gets sort of sucked into this family because she doesn't have a family. And then Jack, you know, wants a family, but there's no luck there. But then Ant turns up. And I wanted to make Draga the kind of character who's got the wisdom that carries them through. So while she's pretty crazy and silly and, you know, gets in your face and does a whole lot of things that are really annoying, every now and again there's this pearl of wisdom that, that comes from her that makes everybody in the story kind of go, whoa, you know. And that's, I think, that was the kind of change I was trying to push through it. Yeah, she calls Jack out a thing. few times. Which she does really call Jack out and she knows how to handle Ant, mm. um, whereas Jack doesn't know how to handle him and so she then takes her cues from from Draga mm. and they sort of you know learn something from each other mm. um, some of which they shouldn't be learning but anyway they do um, yeah so it was kind of fun to write um, but my writing group buddies to the back there was saying that in this the, the follow-up I've kind of lost a bit of his voice because I wrote him he was 17 and and in the follow up he's a couple of years older and so uh, yeah I've, I need to kind of work on that bit of it but, mm. but he came reasonably naturally mm. um, in, oh, great. in, in that one. It's a great one. character yeah. and um, I love the scene where they're underpants shopping for the 17 year olds. <laughs> Priceless. In k <laughs> um, We do have to wrap up this part of the conversation um, but I'm going to give you like another like 10 second grab to say what's next? What's the next book? Um, my next book is due on November 19th. <laughs> no pressure. No pressure. And it is, um, it is back to kind of my original area. It is based on a forgotten pocket of history. It is set um, partly in Australia and partly um, overseas. And it actually follows an artefact that made its way from Europe to Australia. And um, so what loosely modelled it's during World War II and contemporary. So a bit like French Gift or Lost Jewels, it kind of roves between several time frames and um, so I'm just kind of mapping together those last okay. scenes now. Excellent, good luck. Catherine, I've been busting to ask you about the new book that's coming out but we said don't tell me, we'll save it for the panel. So the new book is coming out on the 4th of January. It's called Seven Sisters, it's a standalone and it's, wow, how to put this briefly. A group of women who have all lost a sibling to domestic violence basically get together and decide to exchange murders to take out the perpetrators of the original crimes. We like the sound of that, don't we? We really like the sound of that. We love a good revenge fantasy, don't we? I wonder why. Um, 
<laughs> Lucia, what's the next? What's next for you? Um, so I'm working on Messy Business too. Um, that's cheetah blow. Um, but I'll messier business or messy business comma two. T oh, okay. right. <laughs> uh, that's just the working title, um, and I don't know how long that's going to take. But I have actually just sent out into the world um, a novel which is contemporary women's fiction, um, and I was fortunate I got into the virtual speed dating thing for the ASA, so I've pitched that, and um, that's not funny at all. <laughs> right. okay. So that's that's about a. Um, a, 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 a collage artist who's developed dementia. She's been estranged from her daughter for 20 years. And when she goes into care, the daughter discovers that a childhood home that she had left at the age of eight after her father's death, her mother has had transferred to her, so her mother's never gotten rid of it. And her mother can't explain anything now because she's got this, you know, this dementia. So the daughter goes back to the property and then all the, all the sort of family secrets start mm. to resurface and she has to try and make sense of, you know, her mother's life, her father's life and where she fits in it all. So it's intriguing. Well, I hope it's intriguing, but um, but there's nothing funny in there, sorry. <laughs> Just, that's all right. We'll wait for more. Novels. We'll make for more of Jax's hijinks. I know we'll be able to rely yeah. on that for, yeah, for fun. Okay, so we're going to have a break now. Um, get up, have a stretch, replenish your glasses, have a bit of a shop for merch, and we'll reconvene in 10 minutes, Carmel? Maybe 12 minutes, because that'll make it 9.15, all right? Please join me in thanking our panellists for that terrific conversation. Stretching, yes, stretch. Can you stretch? Sure. Thank you, Lindy. Um, so I hope you all had the chance to, I noticed a lot of you had, did take the chance to buy books, um, merch, um, buy raffle tickets. It's all very exciting. So we are going to start by drawing the raffle and then we're going to go to Q&A from you. Um, so get your questions ready. Polish those questions up. Just a couple of quick reminders that a question does end in a question mark and usually your question should be shorter than the possible answer that one, someone will give you. Um, okay, just hot tip. Um, and Katie, you're fried up. Sure. So when you ask your question, please say your name or your nom de plume, if you prefer. Um, and Katie will write it down so she can um, track the winner. See, I told you, librarians, they're very well organised and very ethical. Okay, so I'm going to ask Kirsty to draw the first winner. And if your name is called or your ticket is called, please bring your ticket up to verify um, and you can come and have your photo taken with Kirsty. Blue 86. Blue 86. <laughs> Does anyone have blue 86? Oh, yes. Yay, Naomi. Come on, girl. Yeah. So we're going to get Catherine to draw the next winner. Blue 55. Blue 55. Something about the blues tonight. Blue 55. Excellent. Congratulations.
watching, Belle. All right, and uh, for the winner of the third bundle, we will get Lucia to draw. Uh, yellow, 95. Yellow, 95. <laughs> Zero nine five. Oh my god. Uh, I promise I work for the library sector too and I'm vetting these, so you can trust me. Look at here, girl. Look at here again. Oh gorgeous. Well done. Well done. Beautiful. All right. So now it's over to you lot to ask questions. Um, I think uh, Lindy has a roving mic. So please put up your hand. Don't be shy. Excellent. Don't forget, don't forget to say your name before you ask your question. Judith. Judith. Oh. I'm Judith, and I wanted to ask if um, any of, if Fanny Fisher's niece had a weapon, like a silver revolver. She actually inherited a pearl-handled revolver from her aunt, so she did have that at her disposal. But she also had, we have a gadgets man, so if you think of those um, those classic sort of 1960s, things like the Avengers and I guess Get Smart without the, the slapstick, there is a gadgets man involved here who can give her lots of things like, you know, a bangle with a little dagger that stabs out of it and things like that. <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> They exist. They exist. Carmel, if you've been to the Spy Museum, they, were, they had a lovely auction a few years ago and there were all sorts of things like lipstick guns and uh, handbags, you know, from the KGB with, with cameras in them and it was quite fantastic. We have another question. Uh, my name is Chris. Um, uh, Catherine, I bought your three art books after reading your first one. Um, I love series. When's the next art mystery coming? Oh, yes. Is Alex going to come back? The next Alex Clayton. There is another Alex Clayton manuscript. Um, okay, Sisters in, Sisters in Crime exclusive. We're actually in just about in pre-production for a television series. So we're... So the fourth book will be timed with that. Oh, so 